Would you just join me in prayer here as we, just, we open up this time? Lord, I just thank you for your presence, for what you're doing, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus. And I pray for more. I pray for increase. God, I, I, I pray over these altars that, uh, that these would be continuously filled with people getting right with you and turning their lives over to you and starting afresh, that eternal life would be poured into this house and into the people and out into the world, that the world could find hope. The life of heaven would invade every circumstance and that you would do it through your people, Lord. And so I just pray for an increase there. I pray also, Father, for the lost or those who don't know where to go, God, that you would, uh, they're like a beacon, Lord, that your church not just the house church, but every church in this region, Lord, that, that the light of heaven would shine on, on those who are giving hope, Lord, and that the gospel would be like a beacon shining out into the darkness that, that people would find their way and, uh, and come to know you, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray for increase to those things. In the day of rain, you pray for rain. I know it feels weird, but it's like God's moving, and so we pray, God, more. Is there anybody wants more? Man, is this, is this the 11 o'clock service? This is the early service. I can't tell here. Come on now. <laughs> Lord, we want more. We just want more. More of you. Mm, we thank you, Jesus. God, I bless our time together today. In your name, amen. 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 You know, this, uh, this time, it's, it's, a, it's historic in that there are so many world events and changes in the world right now that, um, you know, the, the shifts that we're watching, these are, are historic moments taking place. But how many know that God is never surprised by these kind of moments? He's not. He's not surprised by it. In fact, in previous generations, he will have released the solutions through prophetic word. He'll have released the seed the solution in a previous generation so that it had time to mature just in time for the transitions that we see right now. The answer to the world's problems is sitting among you. It's you. It's this generation. It's your kids. The answer to what's needed is found already, have been sown in the past towards your kids, towards you. And that what it's needing is a generation to rise up and hope and apprehend those things, not ignore it, not miss it. You know, when it's harvest time, it's, the proverb says that it's shameful for a son to be asleep in harvest because you had all the months of the time growing for rest, and now when it comes time to reaping, to being out in the harvest fields and bringing in the harvest, when it's time for that, that's not the time to take a nap. Okay, y'all, listen to me. This is not the time to check out. This is not the time to be checking your 401K. Some of y'all know that. Not the time to check your investments. They're going down, baby. Okay? This is not the time to be sitting here pining for a day that is not the day you live in right now. The day you live in right now must be seized. Major transition are happening, like tectonic plates Transition in generations that you and I are to partner in what God's doing, not miss it. The previous generation has heard the Lord speak to them in their hearts, has been dreaming about what God has said, and has raised children to be thinking about what they've been dreaming about. And what that means is that our kids are rising up as visionaries. Our kids are rising up with solutions. If, if you've been sharing what God's been doing in your life over these years, you've been prepping them to step into their day. If you haven't been, don't worry. There's a brand new day at hand, and we get to sow into the next generation. You won't miss it. You just got to wake up. Wake up. It's time. Come on, look at your neighbor and go, wake up, oh sleeper. Wake up. It's time. Wake up. If they're asleep, and go ahead and slap them. The pastor gave you permission. Just slap them. Back of the head. Pop. We do as the, the Puritans did. They got a little feather on the end of a stick for the girls to tickle their ear when they're sleeping and a rod to smack the boys in the back of the head, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun if that's what the usher's job was? How many would take that job? You want that job. Yeah. Ow, I wasn't sleeping. You looked like you were going to. 
I said the first service, man, you guys think I preach long. The Apostle Paul preached somebody to death. <laughs> True story. Book of Acts, they're in an upper room. That story is wild, by the way. If you go back and read that, that story is wild. It says that there were lights in the room. That word is for luminaries. It's for orbs of light hanging out in that room with them as he preached. Some of you are like, whoa. Wait, what do you say? Yes, orbs of light. Little, literally the lights of the angelic realm hanging out in the room as Paul preached into the night. You think this is a charismatic church. What happens if little orbs of light start hanging out with us? Like, that's wild. Okay, like I said, it's a wild story, but Paul is preaching long into the night. He preaches, it says he preaches so long that a young man was sitting in the window and he fell asleep and fell out stories up onto the ground and died. He literally preached him to death. Now, no one has ever died at the house church during a sermon. I have never done that, okay? Someone in the first service says, not yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Paul went and threw himself on that young man's body. He was resurrected right there. It's the, so don't worry, if you die, we'll just raise you back up. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'm so excited about this moment that we're in right now. You know, we have had major transitions in our church's history right at this time. Our church was born on a Saturday night, 2006, I believe it was April, it was 8th or 9th, I'm pretty sure it was the 9th, but I have to look back, but 2006, it was a Saturday night, and a little group of people were just hanging out in a home here in Egan, and that little group has grown into what this is here, but in the beginnings, we just had no idea, and we're just praying and seeking the Lord, and His presence was with us, and there's just a promise of something that just hung out in our hearts. We just knew God wanted to do something. And, you know, I was looking at the history books. I've been doing research. I, I, I can't remember if I shared this or not last week, but I was looking at the, re, the history books of revivals and what God's done in history. And April 9th, 1906, 100 years earlier, the very same day is when the Azusa Street Revival kicked off. 100 years earlier. Something significant about this, this season for us as a church, but there's something significant in history in this season. You know, when you pick up on little breadcrumbs like that, it's like, hmm, God, do it again. God, do it again. Mark this generation for, for transformation, for revival, for a move of God that changes everything. Does anybody want to be a part of that? Last couple of weeks, I've been talking about the momentum that happens when generations work together. We're going to continue that conversation today. It's the it's an absolute miracle. I've done literally three sermons in a row as a series. I cannot believe this has happened. It's a sign of the time. There must be glory on this because there's no way. I have never in the history of my whole, everything, every, I have never been able to preach even two sermons in a row on the same topic. Here we are, it's week three. It's a sign and a wonder, all right? So you're, you're present for it. But we've been talking about how the role of the older generation is to hold up the testimony of what God's done in their lives. Like Moses lifted up the rod. The rod represented what God had done in history. The move of God in Moses' generation, it was all represented in that, that stick, the shepherd's rod. And Moses went up on the hillside and standing on the testimony, he raised up his history in God so that Joshua, who was facing his own battle, whenever Joshua would look up on the hill, he would see the rod of God being lifted up, a previous generation holding up what God had done in the past, declaring God's faithful. He'll be faithful for you. That when Joshua, when that rod was lifted up, Joshua prevailed in his modern battle and what Joshua was facing. Listen, the older generation, you've had encounters with God. Our process, what we're supposed to do is stand up, holding up and reminding the next generation that God will do it for them too until they get their own victory. Once they get their victory, then they have it. 
Moms, dads, you got kids that are wayward, this is your job. Keep reminding them that God is real till they get their own testimony. Holding up the rod, it's the older generation's job. We encourage and we speak the testimony as God's faithfulness as the youngers rise up. But it's not just on the older generation to make sure that the inheritance is passed on, the baton is passed from generation to generation. Nope, it's also the younger generation's job as well. We have to, as a younger generation, rise up and build a bridge to touch and honor those who have gone before us. We got to do it. I talked to you guys last week that literally the largest transfer of wealth in world history is happening in our day. It's estimated at $10 trillion will transfer from one generation to the next in the next 10 to 15 years. Okay, and that's quickening as there has been crises. That time is shortening. $10 trillion will pass from one generation to the next in value, in companies, in organizations that an older generation started and pioneered and brought forth value. And now they're ready to retire or step out, sell or shut down. And that value will be lost unless the next generation rises up, builds a bridge of honor to walk in the same things that they walked in. Are you with me here? Younger generation, you got to rise up. You got to recognize what God's done and go after it with honor. And you serve. You build that bridge. You value what others have stewarded. And when there's trust established, oh man, it's easy to bless and to give freely what God's put in my life. It's easy to give it away to somebody that I see and recognize is going for the same things that God put in my heart. Easy to get behind that. Are you with me this morning? This experience is the momentum that picks up from generation to generation to generation. God is a multiple generation God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He starts a work in one generation and brings it to completion in another. He sees the end from the beginning. He intends a glorious result, and then he starts in the midst of something that doesn't look anything like that. He speaks a word, and it begins to reverberate through generations until it's fulfilled. This is our God. And you and I find ourselves in a moment of history where this is happening right in front of our eyes and we're invited to participate. Now, I want to talk to you today about a very practical way, moms and dads, sons and daughters, to to intentionally pass the baton of what God's done in your life to the next generation. It matters. It matters so significantly. I've had this story in my own life over and over and over. I wish I could, I wish I had hours today just because I could keep going, literally. I probably have another five weeks of talking about this same subject. It's just so real for me. It's the history of our church and who we are, and I want you to get it so badly today. There's a momentum available for your life. You don't have to start from square one. There is a spiritual momentum, the blessing of a thousand generations that can come upon your life and surge it forward. Like swimming in the ocean and all of a sudden a riptide, boom, you are off to the races. Your life does not have to take one step at a time, two steps forward, one back. You can grab hold of what God's doing and boom, so much can change in a moment. I want to look at uh, two passages of scripture. It's a bit of a life message for me this morning, and so again, I man, I got five hours of material, and you know, and uh, the worship team went long. Ugh, I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> there is a scripture in Malachi. It says Malachi chapter four, verse five and six. A lot of people know it. Um, I want to look at it maybe with fresh eyes today. There's a principle that's hidden right in plain sight that once you see it, it, it'll transform your thinking. 
It says this, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. I'm going to read it one more time. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Sometimes when I read the scriptures, I will take a passage that I can see there's a cause and effect to it. And instead of continuing trying to read it forward to understand, I'll just literally take it in reverse and sometimes the truth will pop out at you. It's just a little tool, you know. Uh, in this case, so we're going to go backwards to the front, okay. So that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Okay, so there are consequences that result when the hearts of children and the hearts of fathers are disconnected. Consequences happen when two generations are not walking together. When a father generation and a son generation, and I'm using these, you know, they're gender terms, but it's, it's, it's you, it's usums. Usums, you get it? Good, all of us, it's all of us. When, when, when an older generation and a younger generation, when a fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, when they are not walking together, when they're not facing each other, when they're not working together, then there is a, a downfall, there's a, a curse that's resulted, there's consequences that take place. I, I, because we've been talking about Israel so often recently, when you see the Israelites come out of slavery and God's bringing them towards the promised land, that generation that saw all those miracles, they were brought right to the edge of the promised land and God wanted them to go in. He was trying to help them to enter into promise, fullness. But that generation turned their heart. That generation got fear. There's lots of reasons why you might turn your heart away from the previous generation. You get embittered against them. You get angry at them. They, they fell short of your expectations. You're disappointed in them. Maybe there was, you know, a fallout. Maybe there's unforgiveness. Maybe there's bitterness that goes on. I don't know why you and your parents aren't talking anymore, but I can tell you that the result of it is catastrophic. It's not good. It's not insurmountable because God goes ahead and he just moves right around that generation to the next one. But I don't want that to happen to your kids. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to walk in fullness and promise. And so this becomes vital. It's important. That generation that refused to enter in got disconnected and it was their kids that ended up stepping into promise and they died in the wilderness. Just take your finger, just go like this, make a fist, okay? You're not going to point it at anybody else. You're just going to point at yourself and go, that ain't going to happen to me. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> no. And so that's why you're going to listen to Pastor Jamie today. <laughs> go back to the first verse there. When the prophetic is released, it creates the opportunity for generations to turn towards themselves. And instead of curse, they reverse curses. Instead of consequences, there's healing. Okay, the atmosphere for generations to work together is a prophetic atmosphere. When the spirit of prophecy goes out, when we hear with our ears, you know, when we hear the voice of the Lord, when, when we hear God's version of history, not CNN, Fox, or whoever your favorite, you know, news channel is, not, not that version of modern, but look to see what God says about your circumstance. Look at your prophetic words. Look at what God said about the future and stir that up. See, the prophetic is... God's saying over people, this is my intended version. This is where you're heading. You're meant for glory. 
Sin has caused you to fall short of that. And so when we prophesy, we're telling people about the sin, not the sin part of it, but the glory they're falling short of. We talk to people about the end. So prophecy is. And so in an atmosphere where prophecy comes, what's it do? It awakens older people, younger people, to start to look at the future with hope. To look at each other, not with accusation. You are the one that screwed it up. No, you're the one that screwed it up. No, you're the one. Oh, look at you. Like, when we accuse each other of messing it all up, guess what happens? Nothing good. When we blame one another, nothing good. When one generation looks at the other and goes, hey, y'all messed the world up. Is that helpful? Nope. Why? Because the older generation got the money. You want them to work with you, younger generation? You want that resource to be able to fix the world? Ah, you might want to, you know, stop blaming. (laughs) Okay. I don't got enough time to do these rabbit trails today. You got it, right? There's another passage of scripture. First of all, I want you to notice something. Elijah the prophet, that's one experience. Next verse. Fathers, another experience. Children, another experience. You got three groups of people here. That process looks generational in the Old Testament. Now let's fast forward to the New. The prophet Malachi saw something. God revealed it to him, and he saw this thing. He saw this dynamic. Generations working together, the spirit of prophecy, good stuff happening, or bad stuff. The prophet Joel also saw the same thing, only he described it different. And we get to pick up with in the book of Acts, because something happens on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit pours out on the people there. Jesus has raised from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. He says to his disciples, go to Jerusalem. Do not leave until you receive the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit's coming for you. Okay? Holy Spirit's never lived inside of people. He's come upon people and left them throughout history except for Christ. The Holy Spirit came upon him and remained. That's a different thing. Jesus is departing them and says, hey, I need you to hang out in Jerusalem because that same thing is going to happen to you. You're going to become the temple of the Holy Spirit. They go to Jerusalem. They're waiting. The Holy Spirit comes. Boom. Fireworks. Literally. Tongues of fire. Languages. Outpouring. Lots of people get saved. It's revival. It's awesome. And this is what Peter says. He stands up in the midst of that crowd. He says, taking his stand among the eleven, he raised up his voice and he declared to them, Men of Judah, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you. Give heed to my words. These men are not drunk, Troy. (laughs) It's only the third hour of the day. Keep going. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. It shall be in the last day, God says, that I'll pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they'll prophesy. Position in society, gender, relationship to society, all of it didn't matter. None of those boundaries are in place. The Holy Spirit was going to come on all people. And what's the result? Prophecy. What's the purpose of prophecy? Ah, to convict of the glory we're falling short of. What happens when the spirit of prophecy falls on a generation that has a divide between generations? Hearts of fathers turn towards their children, children towards their fathers. And all the bad stuff that everybody's saying is going to happen, it gets fixed. Listen, there's a lot I could say about this right now, but I want to focus in on on one thing. Can you go back one verse there, please? Your young men will see vision, your old men will dream dreams. When the prophetic spirit comes, when, when prophecy comes, when you hear somebody talk about God's plan, what God wants to do, it'll inspire your imagination. You'll start to think about ways that that could take place. I wonder how God will do that. I, I wonder what it'll look like. And and as you're imagining, as you're allowing the spirit of prophecy, you're you're looking at what God says, and it's inspiring your holy imagination. And you begin to dream about it. 
you begin to conceive and think about how it might come to pass. You're looking at a, the future with hope and you're going in anticipation and you're going, wow, I wonder how God will do that. And then you start to think about it and dream about it. And when you receive a prophetic word, you start to think about how you will play a role in what God's doing. It's all happening in you when you receive a prophetic word. It's amazing. It's powerful. This scripture says that when that happens to an older generation, that an older generation who has less time available to them, an older generation that does not have the benefit of waiting it out and letting it unfold on its own, the older generation sees the limitation of time, sees the limitation of their days, and so when prophecy comes, they begin to dream. And that's a God thing because dreaming is normally a young person's sport. Older people do not dream. You think about things like Florida, Arizona. What are you going to... Listen, I, there's no offense here. There really is not. None intended, okay? That's why we're going to call you guys the father and mother generation, not the old generation. And instead of young men, we're, you know, we're going to call the sons, the daughters generation. Are you with me here? But you know what I mean. All right. <laughs> no one wants to identify themselves as old, but I can tell you this, that if the limitation of days is in your mindset, you won't think past what's possible. You won't. You, you will conceive of what can be done in the next couple of years. You're, you're not thinking beyond that. It takes the Holy Spirit for you to think beyond the limitation of your days. It takes the Holy Spirit. And when the spirit of prophecy comes on the fathers and mothers, they begin to dream beyond their days to what's possible in the future, to days that they won't see themselves. This is a God thing. Do me a favor, just for a moment, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. No one's going to do anything to you. Just think for a moment, okay? I want you to imagine your absolute dream home. Absolute dream home. I want you to picture it in your mind right now, okay? Is it in a, is it, is it in a city? Is it surrounded by pasture? Is it on a mountaintop? Is it along an ocean? I don't know. Where? Where's your dream home? What's it look like? It's got a fence around the property. Is it acreage? Is it a penthouse? Is it surrounded by people? Are you all alone and you can walk around and do whatever you want? What, what does it look like to you? Is there, is there a, a porch that wraps around it or is it a high rise with mirrored glass? What's the view look like? Come on, I want you to imagine it from the outside looking in. What's it look like from the outside? What color is it? You walk in through that front door. What's, what's it look like? Is it a grand entrance? Is it simple? Are you surrounded by family or is it just, you know, just you? What's your dream dwelling look like? Okay, everybody got kind of a picture there? Now, open your eyes. Just look up at me. Okay. If I gave you a piece of paper, you could draw it for me. Maybe in simplistic version. Some of you, you know, it'll look like my two-year-old did it. That's okay. But... Others are artists, and you can draw it out with great accuracy, but you could draw it out. You could describe for me, if I asked you questions, you could tell me what it looks like. Great accuracy, you could tell me. Okay, but I promise you that if you take that piece of paper, no matter how beautiful and how accurate it is, if you take that piece of paper to a builder, they cannot build it. <laughs> Why? Because it's not an architectural blueprint. It's a dream. It doesn't matter how accurate your dream is. You can't build a dream. It has to be transformed into a vision. You don't know how many rafters until somebody quantifies it. You don't know how many steps up, steps down, how many pieces of glass, how many faucets, how many outlets. You don't know any of that stuff until somebody with a vision, somebody who is beyond the dreaming phase can quantify it for you and put it out into a, a format that someone can build. That's a different gear of thinking. 
You're not dreaming about it. You're quantifying it. This is a two different experiences. And no matter how accurate your dream is, you cannot build your dream. Some of you are like, man, Pastor Jamie, that was a little harsh. <laughs> no, no. See, this is what happens. And I, I want you to grab hold of this so desperately because if you figure out how to do this, you will see incredible things take place in your lifetime. Okay? God prophesies in generations. He speaks a word to one generation intending a result in the other. Those of us who perceive that God is at work in the generations, not just in ours, who don't believe it's about us, but believe that you and I are a bridge between two parties, who are willing to lay down your life to see the God thing happen, not just your thing happen. See, some, everybody wants to be Jacob. I want to be the fulfillment of promise. But can I tell you something? You're not Jacob. You're Isaac. You're the generation between. Nobody wants to be Isaac. That's who you are. You're not David. Everybody wants to be King David. You're not David. You're Jonathan. Your job is not to be the superstar. Your job is to lay down your life in covenant to help others succeed. That's your job. Your job is to make sure other people get to succeed. Well, who's David? Jesus. We get to stand on his foundation, but he gets all the credit, y'all. Not you, not me. Oh, come on now. You got to get this. If you get this, you're going to get free today. and Everybody around here is going to do the happy dance. Okay? Hear me. When the Spirit of God prophesies, when a generation catches wind of what God wants to do and they communicate that, what that does in hearts is it awakens them to dream. What's it going to look like? And when dreamers rise up and begin to share the dream, the God dream, with the younger generation, guess what they get to do? They start to envision how to make it happen. One generation catches a glimpse of what God is doing and wants to do. The next generation starts to dream about how to make it happen. And they save up resources and then they pass it on to the younger generation to build. Samuel the prophet anoints Saul as king. He's a forerunner king. God raising up a kingdom in Israel. Jonathan partners with a little shepherd boy named David who's going to be the next king. Jonathan lays down his life so that another can step into his rightful passage. David catches a glimpse of what God wants. God wants to dwell with men. Oh man, I hope you're hearing this. God wants to dwell with people. And so David, one day he goes, oh, I'm not even going to build a house for myself until I find a resting place to build you a house, God. That's his declaration. God hears him say that and says to David, because of this declaration, because of your hard intention, I will make sure a descendant always sits on your throne. Jesus sits on David's throne. Because God wants to dwell with men, David caught hold of God's dream, the prophecy, and started to intend towards it. But then God says something so bizarre to David. He says, I'm sorry, son, you don't get to build it. You have blood on your hands. Your son will build it. If you guys know the story, it's Solomon, David's son, who builds the temple. Solomon will be a man of peace. David was a man of war. God says to David, your, ha your hands have blood on them, so you can't build it. Can I interpret that a little differently than... Sometimes people think, oh, it's because David had sin in his life and that's why he couldn't build God's temple. No, no, no. That's not it at all. God looked at David and said, David, you're really good at swinging a sword. You're terrible at swinging a hammer. <laughs> David, you are dreaming if you think you can build my temple. But your son will be an architect. So did that just like shut David's dream down? Did he be like, well, fine then. And he, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. And I'm not going to think about it. No, what did David do? David started saving up inheritance to pass on to his son. Solomon didn't have to raise a single cent. When Solomon became king, the first thing he does is he goes and builds that temple. He didn't have to raise any money at all. Why? Because David had spent his life raising the inheritance for the dream to take place. And I promise you, David's heart was so turned towards Solomon. 
And Solomon turned his heart towards his father, and as a result, something beautiful emerges in the earth. Oh, are you catching this? Listen, friends, you might not know what to do with your life right now. Maybe you're a little lost. Like, where's the breadcrumbs of, of what, how do, I, how do I walk in what God's wanting to do in our day of history? What do I do? And so you're looking forward and you're trying to plan. Oh, what do I do, God? What do I do? You're searching all over and you're, you're not sure what to do, how to move forward, young people. So many going to college asking higher education to tell them who they are. So many looking at their peers like an Absalom going, hey, boys, what do you think of my kingship? Asking one another who they are, and identity can't come through peer relationships. The answer isn't written before you. you don't, you're not looking at all the crises of history right now wondering, well, I wonder who I am. Nothing is going to answer you from there. But you can find out who God made you to be if you will slow down a moment. Just slow down just a moment. And instead of looking forward trying to predict the future, turn around and look at what God's been doing. Look at what God's been doing and it'll tell you where he's going. Look at, look at, look at the history of what God's done in your family Look at the history of what God's done in the community that he brought you into. Look at the revival history in our land. Look at the spiritual fathers and mothers that God's raised up over the last generation. Look at what God's done. Turn around. Instead of trying to predict your own future and thinking about you, why don't you see yourself as a bridge or a fulfillment of what God started before? Instead of trying to I need to hear my own word and pioneer my own destiny. Oh, my goodness, rubbish, y'all. Then you're going to have to work really hard. That inheritance that's for you is going to go by the wayside. You don't have to start off on your own. What you have to do right now is look around who God linked you to already because this is what God does is he brings your resources into your present day. But you have to honor and value what God's been doing in order to receive from them. Fathers and mothers who listen to the prophetic and dwell on it, they'll dream. Fathers and mothers that are dreaming about what God wants to do, they'll share those dreams with their children and their children will be visionaries who will do great things. We're in this moment of history right now where we need great things to emerge. We're in this moment of history right now where the younger generation has an absolute identity crisis. They don't know who they are. Gender is in question. Marriage is in question. Core principles, money, society, all of this stuff is swirling and all of it's centered around identity and purpose. And the younger generation is looking at videos online and looking to sitcoms and looking to the world to tell them who they are and there's no answer for them there. Nothing that's good. However, if fathers and mothers who have been listening to the prophetic words and been dreaming about what God wants to do, if you will start casting the dream over your children's hearts, Share with them the things that your parents used to dream about, what you dream about, what your grandparents used to dream about. Share with them the lineage and the connectedness of how their life is connected to something bigger than themselves. Listen, some of you in here today, and I'm speaking to you, and you're like, man, I really wish someone would have done that for me. It's never too late. You are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that are all cheering you on, and there is inheritance waiting for you to grab hold of. But what it takes is honor. you got to value. Build the bridge. Open the, mo- open the modern gate. Last week, remember? The ancient doors. It's all waiting for you. It's open. The king of glory wants to come into your life. Is there anybody this is speaking to this morning? I'm just looking for someone to preach at. Akil, you good? Okay. Here's the deal. God has great things for your life, man. 
and great things. And it didn't start with you, and it won't end with you. In your future are children and children's children. There's a heritage of godliness that's coming from you. And into the future, into future generations, they will rise up and look backwards and thank God for yours and your wife's life because the choices that you're making. The dreams of your heart are going to come to pass. You might not see the fullness of them in your lifetime, but you'll get to see first fruits. David got to pitch a tent in his backyard for God's presence to be there. He didn't get to see the full thing. But it's okay because David wasn't resentful that he didn't get to see it. He wasn't trying to be the superstar. He was laying down his life so that others could live. And because of that, your name will continue to live on. And God's goodness is going to be seen in the land of the living because of the heritage of godliness that the Lord pours through your life. A thousand generations of blessing are at your door waiting to come upon your life to give you great momentum. And all you have to do is look around. Just pause for a moment and recognize all that God's done in your history. Look around at the people that God gathered around you. Value them. Recognize that the blessing of the Lord is available to you if you'll just honor and value them. That stuff comes upon you and adds such spiritual momentum and you'll be doing amazing things. It's not about you, though. The second you think it's about you, you'll be right out of the current be sitting there waiting, and the Lord wants to heap upon you grace upon grace. There's such great things planned for your future. I'm talking to all of you, by the way. Some of you are like, Man, I wish you was talking to me. I am talking to you. Come on now. You have choices, though, don't you? Will you blame or will you value? Will you honor Or will you criticize? See, I am of the opinion that the Lord wants to reverse curses in the land. Iniquity that was sown and has been in the land a while, but it takes more than one generation to do that. So the Lord prophesies over a generation, and then people begin to dream and envision And all in a moment of time, the Lord can take, add grace to them, and reverse what the enemy meant for evil. He can turn it. He can turn it. I'll tell you a story, and we'll land the plane here. This is not, this, this series, these things I've been speaking about, this is how I live. This is how I've chosen to live. I, it's how we built the house, church. We have, we've never stood alone on our own vision. I, I've always, this is just my choice in leadership, I've chosen to look at the people that God brings to us, elders, men and women have gone, who've gone before us, and ask the question, look to see what God had percolated, the prophetic words, the dreams of their heart, and then that's why we build the things we do. That's how we've always done it. When we moved into this building, um, I was handed a set of blueprints in that set of blueprints, the very last document, in fact, was on the blueprints is the name Jesus People. Jesus People Movement, Jesus People Church, all that stuff's got revival history in it. I was handing this set of blueprints, and the very last, very last image was a picture of this property that we're on and a building that didn't exist yet. And when I saw that, I went, oh, that's the dream of a previous generation. I guess we're supposed to build, God. How did we end up with this facility? Was it because Pastor Jamie has such a grand vision? No, it's because I looked backwards at what God had done in the previous generation, and I saw that there was momentum to do something in ours. So I look at that, and I go, oh, Lord, you want us to build. So we begin to value and dream. Listen, the previous generation, the Jesus people, this was, they, they dreamed about what this could be, but they were unable to fulfill it, which means that the prophetic words and the reasons they moved out here and did this thing remained unfulfilled. And so me, as a son, if I honor what they intended, I can step right into the spiritual momentum. That's exactly what took place. We began to develop architectural blueprints of our own to honor the spirit 
of prophecy to honor what God had started, the dreams of fathers. I didn't use their blueprints as ours. Listen, young people, you don't have to do exactly what the old people tell you to do. What's Bitcoin, you know? Like, no. (laughs) What you need to do is honor what God was doing in them and value it so that carries forward. And it will give you vision for your future. And so we looked at this and went, oh, we're supposed to build. So I started developing architectural blueprints. And there's so many stories along with this. But as soon as I started attempting to do that... I got a call from a business person. I'm talking in the same meeting. I gathered the staff around. I said, hey, guys, we need to start a capital campaign. We're going to put our hands to this. We're going to make this happen. In the same meeting as I announced it to our staff, I got a phone call from a local businessman who did not attend the church. Said, hey, can you come over for a meeting? Yeah, it's like, yeah, sure. He said, like, right now. They were down the street, so I jumped in my car. I went down, went and sat in the boardroom. The whole family's sitting there. I'm like, okay, what's up, you know? And they said, listen, the Lord told us to fund your next building project. How much do you need? Before I told you about it, the Lord had already released resources to make it happen. Resources that were tied up in a previous generation, but as soon as we stepped our spiritual momentum into honor what God was already doing, the resources were already there to build. (sighs) Maybe you're stuck because you're trying to do your thing. Stop trying to do your thing. Look around at what God's done in history. Step into that and woo, there we go. A little ways into this experience, there's a day, and I, I, we're dreaming about the Minnesota River Valley and what God wants to do. This is a connected story. The, we're dreaming about what God wants to do in our region, and, and I am looking online at all the different prophetic words that God has released over the state of Minnesota. And I find this webpage that was listed out all these prophetic words over our state, over Minnesota. And so I begin to read them, and I'm trying to value the prophetic words so that I can dream according to what God wants. And so I'm doing that, and I notice that most of them are from this person named Cindy Jacobs, right? And she's been prophesying over Minnesota for a long, long time, y'all, like 30 years of prophecies. Listen, and so I start reading them, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing because these words sound a lot like us. Like, oh, like, you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. I'm like, that's us. She's talking about us. So one week, I just stood up in the pulpit, you know, just grabbed hold of it. I said, I read all the prophetic words, and I said, this is us. She was prophesying about us. Now, did it matter if it was actually us or if it was someone to come? No, you know why? Because when you value and you honor the prophet in the name of the prophet, you get the reward. Yeah. Do you... So I'm, I'm honoring it. I'm like, hey, this is us. Let's do this. Service ends. It's a nice sermon. It was fine. This one's better, okay? That one's fine. <laughs> like, we end the service, and like, we go on our merry ways, and it's, it's Tuesday. It's like three days later, and I get a phone call from Cindy Jacobs' personal assistant. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Cindy's in town this next week. I don't know Cindy. I've never met her before. She doesn't know us. No connection. Okay, somehow the name the house popped in somebody's head along the way, and boom, like, hey, let's just see. I don't know. It's a God thing. Okay, no correlation. Cindy's in town this week, and she doesn't have a place to speak on Saturday night. Do you want her? <laughs> Do you, you get this? We literally honored the prophet name of prophet, and we're literally the next, the next Saturday night, she's going to be speaking. I've never met this person in our life. It literally went, we're valuing what you've said about our state and what God's doing, and the next week she's standing in our pulpit prophesying. Well, I picked her up from the, there was an event going on in the north of the cities, and I went and I picked her up. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I'm bringing her down to speak at Saturday night. She opens the door to my car. She gets in. She sits down. She looks over at me, and she goes, 
what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> she said, I have not preached in a new church in 20 years. I don't preach in new churches. I have so many relationships. I just work with the people I have relationship with. I don't preach in new churches. So what am I doing here? And I go to open my mouth to say something, and finally, and she just looks at me. She goes, never mind, never mind, never mind. Don't tell me anything. It'll be the word of the Lord. Don't tell me anything. She gets in the pulpit that night. She just prophesies. The Lord says this is the new Jesus people movement. She starts, she starts reading our mail about all that we've been saying and proclaiming and the fulfillment of these prophetic words she's prophesied. She's going, this is that. Okay? Her second visit here, we're walking in. It was that old room. We're walking in from the side door. She grabs hold of my arm as we're walking in the door. And she goes, Jamie, hold me. She said, I'm in an open vision right now and I cannot see, so you're going to have to lead me. She goes into an open vision. She says, we are standing in a room that's at least three times as big as this one. And there's cameras everywhere and the place is full and God's moving. And she prophesies. She stands up on stage that night and she goes, I am here to prophesy the next like the next building that you guys will be in. And she releases this word and describes the very room that you're sitting in. So when we heard the word that confirmed the dream and the vision, we knew it was time to step forward in it. Do you see this? This is how it works, y'all. You're sitting in the miracle. Come on, a golf clap ain't going to work it. And it's, yeah. It's not about big churches. That's not about these things. This is how it works. If you will value and honor what God's done in the past, there's a, gen there's a thousand generations of blessing that want to come upon your life. The baton wants to be passed off to you. Will you value and honor? Will you grab hold of what the previous generation valued and honored? Because that inheritance is there for you to run. Fathers and mothers who dream will have children who are visionaries and solve problems. Just begin to cast dreams over your children. Tell them about what God's done in the previous generations. Hold up the stick of your testimony until they get their own. Are you alive? Just stand to your feet today. You got this. Come on, smack somebody in the back and say, you got this. You got it. <laughs> to those in this room and who will listen to this sermon in the future, you would say to me, Pastor Jamie, I don't have that kind of positive, like, three generations back, we were slaves. What are you talking about? Three generations back... Land was taken from us. Destiny stolen. Friends, this is the Lord working. He is wanting to restore what the enemy has stolen. He is wanting to a generation. It's not just race. It's not just gender. It's not just... There is a moment in history right now that the Lord is wanting to bring the spirit of adoption over a generation to give them identity. Where identity has been stolen, he's wanting to breathe identity on them. Listen, if you are in this room today and you would say to me, I don't have godly parents, I'm a first generation Christian, I would say to you, friend, why do you think you're here? The Lord is surrounding you with opportunity. He's surrounding you with a godly heritage. The lines of your inheritance fall pleasantly to you. All you got to do is say yes to him. Let the Lord restore what's been stolen. Don't get caught up in the madness. You will not find your destiny in looking at the problem. You need to take a step back for a moment and receive what Jesus has done in history and on your behalf. He wants to bring healing. He wants to restore wants to make us all family. He wants to remove the divides between generations so that another rift doesn't take place. There's promise in this day. Young men, young women, 
Don't allow your hearts to become hardened with bitterness towards the previous generation. Don't allow it to happen. Yes, there has been mistakes. Yes, there's disappointment. But set those things aside and receive his mercy today. Receive Jesus' mercy. Let him take that pain out so that promise can come in. Holy Spirit of God, I'm asking today that you would come over this people, that a spirit of prophecy would shift this environment, that a spirit of prophecy would rest on this house, that every people that comes in here, they would see the glory of what God's wanting to do so that generations can turn towards each other and bring solutions forth. Oh, Lord, I pray for the hearts of each person here today, and we'll see this in future, that you would recognize the inheritance that's available to you and you wouldn't miss the moment. Holy Spirit, would you come upon people? Surround them, O Lord. Surround them with encouragement. Surround them with courage, O Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for grace upon grace to lay down our lives, to see your dream come to pass to see what you want to see, Father. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here we are, Lord, your people. Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray for healing for each one. Where there has been pain, I pray the Lord would come upon you and heal you. I pray for a spirit of prophecy to give you hope for your future, that you would not be distant. I pray for healing between you and other generations, whether it's your parents or the kids that are coming after you, that you would be healed and restored to them. That what the locusts have eaten, that that would be restored to you in these days. That where there has been degrading and brokenness, that he'd bring healing, restoration, and promise. Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I bless your people today. Listen, I do this every week. It's not my blessing I'm releasing. It's the priestly blessing. It's generational. It's what the Father releases over you. May the Lord bless you. A thousand generations of blessing come upon your life. May the Lord protect and keep you. May the Lord's favor be upon you, his countenance towards you, that you would know his kindness. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord grant you his shalom, his peace, that you would be kept heart and mind all your days and advance his kingdom. I bless you today, church, in the name of Jesus on whose foundation we stand. And everybody who agreed with that said. Come on, can we give a good clap to the Lord today?